Hey guys, welcome back, it's Meg. Today we are doing our seasonal video of healing the hardest bosses in Mythic Plus as Miss Weaver. I also have the cooldown sheet and everything available down in the description. That is something that I will be updating throughout the season. It's not going to be perfect for every group and it's going to be depending on your comp as well as what cooldowns you have going into it. But that is just what I was using as a baseline for 20s. For this boss, there is a couple of ways that people are doing it. Typically, I prefer the strategy where you kill Nash Tooth first, but if you are in a pug, you may want to focus down Trick Totem. If you do focus down Trick Totem, you're going to have to heal through more of the Frenzies. On pull, I'm going to open up with GG to get ready for the first Nash Frenzy. I'm going to get one set of Enveloping Breaths out on as many people as I can before the damage actually starts, and then I am just going to be using GG to cleave off of the other mobs to heal people up as he is running around doing that Frenzy. In this situation, you can also use Shaylun's, but I actually don't think I used it during this entire fight, so that is another tool that you have access to. Sometimes I will be using Shaylun's after the Trick Totem phase, and I will use it to top people if they've taken damage from the Earth Bolts if those are not getting kicked, but generally there's not much damage going on outside of that frenzy from Nash Tooth. Because the damage on this fight is pretty front-loaded, and it is only every so often with that Nash frenzy, I believe it's once a minute, if you get targeted with the Mark for Butchery, in my case I can Shadow Meld it off, or you can use other invises in the group if it targets someone else, it can also be bopped, but if you don't have any way to actually stop the damage, then you can use your Shaylun's there, or you can use Cocoon, in addition to your Enveloping Mist and Soothing Mist. So we actually handle this fight very well. This is something that I've seen ruin a lot of groups, is that Frenzy not being able to be healed off. So it is something that you can also send health pots for. I did there. I also had Fort Brew and Dampen both up because it is physical damage. That is another option. I just didn't really find it necessary. I wanted to see how much it did without defensives. Now that Nash Tooth is dead here, the only damage that's going to be going out is the Earth Bolts from the Trick Totem boss. This isn't really anything to worry about. If you get targeted three times in a row, you'll definitely make sure that you use a defensive. I ended up doing that, but it shouldn't one-shot anybody. And as long as they're topped, you should just be able to swap kicks and just continue to DPS. Next up is the third boss of Halls of Infusion. This one has been asked about a lot. This is a classic single target rot fight, but the rot is pretty significant and there is a little bit of forced downtime that can end up making Miss Weaver a little harder on this fight if you're not tanking it in the right spots. We are going to go ahead and open up with Lust and with GG, but I'm not going to be using my pot until a bit later where I don't have cooldowns or we don't have defensives. The big thing here is making sure that you have renewing miss uptime, as well as making sure that you are cycling defensives properly. This is the one boss that I have actually considered swapping to manatee on, both for the mana saving as well as the uh, four piece interaction. However, I do not have the Rashok trinket, which is a lot of HPS, a lot of mana, and some verse. So I think once I get that trinket, I will not be wanting to use manatee, but until then I was considering it. So. If that's something that you're finding that you want, then obviously go ahead and swap, but if you have the good trinkets, then it might not be necessary. At this point, I have used my potion because I do not have GG and I just use Shaylin's. GG will be coming up now and I'm going to use it after we are done with this Glacial Surge, so I'm getting as much uptime as I can. And we are just trying to spread the envelopings on everyone for the enveloping mist as well as the enveloping breath. This is a fight where you can pretty much ignore yourself as long as you are using your healing elixirs and your defensives. You shouldn't have to have too much self-healing here.
This fight is as much of a DPS check as it is a healing check. It is also somewhat of a comp check. It'll be a lot easier if you have things like AG and V and VE, as well as a prop pally with Spellbop, Sack, and Devo, as well as all of their off healing makes it much easier. So comp is something to keep in mind, although I don't find it to be a limiting factor because it is possible to do without on like 23-24 as well. You can see I kind of start to let all of my hots fall off, but I am going to be going into Chiji, so Rapid Diffusion is going to be reapplying those Runary Mists. So I still have two charges, and I'm just going to finish Chiji, and then I can go ahead and reapply those. But the boss is dead at this point, so it's not something I'm super concerned with, and we'll just finish off with a Shaylin's. This boss is one of the most asked about this season, mainly because even on a 20 fortified, you have the potential to get one shot if you are not using your defenses properly. And this goes not only for healers, but for everybody. So this boss being a group effort, it has a lot more potential to go wrong outside of just meeting a healing or a damage check. It's hard to do a tutorial for this boss because it is such a group effort and it really depends on your comp as well as the races. If you have a paladin and dwarves as well as warriors, everything can make it so much easier or so much harder depending on what group comp you have. Typically, I will play it the same every time. I will open with Chi-Gi for the first Earthen Shards if we are not using an immunity on it, and then I will move on to Shaylun's or Cocoon, depending. If I get the shards, I use Dampen first, and then Cocoon if I have it, and then Fort Brew as a last resort. Very rarely do I get targeted three times in a row, but it has happened. But yeah, I will typically swap between GG on opener, Shaylun's Cocoon. Revival doesn't do a whole lot, you can use it to top after the Crushing Stomp, but typically it's not going to save someone if they have the debuff. I went ahead and used my pot here, and then I have Chi-Gi coming back up. Still haven't used my Shaylans because we have quite a bit of utility in this group between Block, Sack, Bop, we have Dwarves, Block, things like that. So this is a very good comp for it. But it's good to try to aim to get your cooldowns in places where you're not going to be using those immunities or those defensives. When you don't have cooldowns, you can just stand there and channel Soothing Mist. This is one of those fights that no matter how good of a healer you are, you may not be able to save everyone because they do have to be a bit responsible for themselves sometimes. Even using defensives, it is important that you are on the lookout for being able to stun this boss during the stomp. This will make it much easier for your healer to top people because they will not be waiting to land, as well as it just reduces the amount of damage that the Earthen Shards target is taking even during defensives. Naraxxus is the third boss of Neltherian Slayer and probably one of my least favorite bosses in this whole season, mainly just because it's so frantic and it seems super inconsistent. The big thing here is you want to make sure that you have good melee uptime. On this fight it can be kind of challenging, but it is something that you want to try and focus on because dropping your hots off is going to spell some trouble. This is also fairly comp dependent. If you have a lot of poison dispels, then it makes this fight quite a bit easier. If you don't, then you're going to be a little bit more pressed for mana. I tend to play this the same way. I start with TG, I use Cocoon on someone else, and then I cycle my defensives first. I send Shaylun's as well as Revival is available. I end up on this fight in this footage. I whiff my Revival. I use it as a panic heal when I should have saved it just a couple more seconds to use as a dispel, but you do have access to that tool. 
I also ran Manatee on this fight. This was the first run that I had used Manatee in a really long time. And I think that it was useful, but I think I could definitely optimize it more because I kind of forgot that I had it. This fight, it's also very important to make sure that your DPS are focusing down the adds that spawn as well as properly placing the Rancid Maw. It is also on your DPS to get out of the Rancid Maw as quickly as possible because they are going to be taking damage from that as well as the rocks as well as the spit. So the rains are going to be getting kind of blasted here so make sure that you are giving some extra attention to them. If you find that they are standing too far out, you can ask them to scoot in a little bit so that they benefit from ancient teachings, but they shouldn't have to stand too far out. If you're in a group that has a lot of dispels, you can go ahead and pre-assign your dispels. I always dispel myself, our druid always gets himself, I believe our tank always gets our mage, because the tank isn't going to be taking too much damage during this, so if you're able to kind of set those up beforehand, it'll be very helpful during those poison phases. During the spike tongue, the only damage going out are the rocks, so you're not super concerned with topping yourself quickly and you can kind of spend more time DPSing. As a melee, I always step out a little bit further as my tank is coming back from that tongue mechanic, mainly because I don't want to get meleeed and it does happen. There's a lot of totem bosses this season that will melee you and they also have a lot of knockback mechanics. Uh, the other big one being in Halls of Infusion, the last boss has a very similar thing, so be aware of that. I usually will use that as an opportunity to put out my Renewing Mists if I am missing those, as well as replacing my Feyline if I need Ancient Teachings or just want a better angle on my Stomp. This ground gets a little weird because it has some cracks in it so your Stomp can get folded up like it does. You can see here I let most of my Hots drop off and I have both of my charges on cooldown. And I also don't have any other cooldowns to use outside of a 5 stack of Shaylins, which isn't a whole lot, but it's better than nothing. So just again, make sure that you are keeping your Renewing Mist up as much as you can. So this boss has actually gotten a little bit difficult since its rework from BFA. Uh, it doesn't start until you reach that 60% threshold though, so I went ahead and just kind of skipped forward to that part. But for this Whirling Dagger, it is a heavy bleed that goes out on everybody, and you are not going to have a cooldown for every single one. So managing your defensives as well as making sure that people are managing their defensives is very important on this fight. Typically, I will start with Chi Ji, and then I will use Shaylins, and then Revival, and then Chi Ji again. On some of these, with the overlap with the Cannon Barrage, you are going to want to save something to precast or use Revival there since it's instant. Being able to put out a lot of healing while not being able to stand still is actually something that Miss Weaver is very good at. So you want to make sure that you have your hot spread throughout the whole thing. We have a block use there, Health Pot from the Evoker and I used the defensive a little bit earlier. If you had lust, you would lust at 60% on this boss. Depending on your route and your speed, you may not have it though. We had someone get hit by, I think a cannonball or a blade, but we are just gonna brez them. Here we have Chi Chi up again. I like to use it a little bit early to pre-spread the enveloping mist and the enveloping breath so that the hots carry through the movement phase and we don't have to worry too much about actually trying to stop and heal during the cannon barrages. I used my health pot here since I didn't have a defensive. You also have healing elixir at your disposal. It's very useful for the high movement phase. You don't need to completely top everyone during this, you just need to make sure that they're not dying so that you can top them when the movement stops. Typically using Shaylins below 5 isn't something that I do too much, but it is something that I do here. 
This boss actually hasn't changed a whole lot since BFA. He was one of the first bosses that I ever felt like I finally figured out by myself because I started pushing in BFA, so I actually really like this guy. We are going to lust on pull. I also sent my pot right away, but you can hold it if you want. The big healing phase during this boss is the tantrum as well as post tantrum and post charge if you are not killing the ticks. Although if you're not killing the ticks, it's most likely going to be a wipe just because if you get overrun with them, it is so much damage burst when they die as well as bleed on whoever they are near. So stomping ticks is definitely a priority here. For the first tantrum, I am using Chi Ji, and because he's running around the room, you're not going to be able to stay in melee, so this is a precast and pre spread, and then you can extend, let the hots carry most of it, and if you need to, you can stand in the middle and use Shaylun's to top everyone else for the rest of the tantrum hits. This is a room where you want to utilize your transcendence. Typically, we try to keep him in this corner back by the bones, just because it kind of keeps everything much more condensed and it keeps the ticks closer together. For this, I start with Chi-Gi, and then I use Shaylun on the Tantrum, and then you can use your defensives as well as Shaylun for the next Tantrum, and then you'll have Chi-Gi again. You also have access to Revival, which isn't the biggest heal anymore, but it does do a decent amount, again, at not keeping people topped, but keeping people alive so that you can further triage when the movement phase is over. It is important to keep people just healthy enough so that they live so that you can also help stomp ticks as this is going to be more of a group effort again. But this boss is pretty scripted. There's only a couple times where you may be sitting waiting for either the charge or the tantrum and you don't know which one is which. He does have that kind of weird overlap where it could go either way. That was that charge tantrum overlap, so we do have a couple of ticks get out, but we still want to make sure that we are trying to get as many of them stomped as we can. I believe we just ended up with one, and you can see our transcendence back here to bait the charge in a proper direction. Used that big hit of damage that we just took was from the tick dying, and that was just one, so you can imagine how bad it would be if there was more than one, or if there is even like five. Most likely just going to die at that point. The fourth charge and tantrum is coming up, but we decided just to commit to the boss at this point. I would only do this if you're very confident in your group, because if you do not stomp any of the ticks, you're going to have like 20 of them, and then you're just dead. You can see about five of them have spawned there, and another four, and then they're all just going to start coming in. So I did pop GG just as a kind of a panic, but also kind of using it as a single target heal for my tank, because he does have all of those bleeds. Alteris is the second boss of Vortex Pinnacle, and he's kind of Miss Weaver's bread and butter. We are very good at this fight. This is a rot fight, kind of similar to the third boss of Hulls that we looked at earlier, although we are getting a haste buff here, and we have full uptime on the boss. So on this boss, I just cycle between Chi-Gi, Shaylun's, and Revival, and it honestly takes care of itself. The fun thing to do on this boss is if you have Transcendence, you can skip the damage from the tornadoes entirely. This is really a game changer because it allows you to cycle your defensives more effectively, and it also allows you to have more uptime and you're not going to be waiting to drop out of the sky with that slow fall effect. A warrior got hit by the beam there, but we just went ahead and brezzed real quick, and I continue to spread hots and triage. On this fight, you don't have to use your defensives on the rot, and you can just hold them for the tornadoes. If you do have to take a tornado, and people are low on health because they didn't have a defensive or for whatever other reason, you can use your enveloping mist with Thunder Focus T for an instant heal, you can use your Vivify instant proc if you have it, and you can also for yourself use your health pot or your healing elixir. I accidentally double defensive there, I just fat fingered it by accident because they're right next to each other, but don't do that. Chi-Gi is up once again, and we're just going to be using our Instant proc with Enveloping Mist to spread the Enveloping Mist and the Enveloping Breath all around the party just to take care of that rot. But like I said, this fight is kind of perfect for us. We do have a really good toolkit for it, and we can avoid quite a bit of damage.
I was a little hesitant to include this fight. I know that it is a difficult heal check, but it is also a DPS check to kill these sparks in time, the Skyfall Novas. This is another fight where you have the potential to get one shot if there is an overlap. If you have the Chain Lightning targeted on you, in addition to the Skyfall Nova being out, you do need to defensive it because it will hit you hard enough that you may get one shot from that overlap. Typically, I will actually open with GG here, but I used it on the previous pack and I did not have it, so I went ahead and used Shalons first, although it felt kind of icky. In the grounding field, you're going to have a little bit of downtime on melee, depending on how far away he spawns it, but you can use that time to reapply your renewing mist and anything that may have fallen off. This is going to be a defensive while we run over there as well as Chi-Gi, and I sent Cocoon on our Shaman. chi is actually very nice for these damage phases where you're going to have that static cling as well, because you are still using instant healing and you don't have to interrupt your cast. If you're trying to use Shaylens during the Nova and the static cling comes out, make sure that you are timing it properly. Typically, I like to use Shaylens before the jump instead of after, just because I want people to be topped, just in case they actually do get hit by that. Static Cling isn't a guaranteed one-shot, but it does quite a bit of damage, and it is completely avoidable. This is a fight where you're kind of using Healing Elixir on cooldown as well, just chug on them as they come up, because there is enough damage going out where you'll get a lot of value from that instant heal. I don't like to use defensives on just the Chain Lightning at this point, because it's not going to one-shot me if there's no Nova out, so I do want to hold those. We do send our Lust here, and this is also going to be my GG. It's really nice being able to cleave off of the Novas with GG on this, so it is good if your tank gets the boss close as possible. We have the second half of Lust for the second star, I have a 10 stack of Shaylins, and I do use my own Diffuse while I cocoon the Shaman because he is the Chain Lightning target. We also have two Touch of Deaths, so that's actually very nice for these Novas as well. This is a fight you'll see me use Essence Font a lot on, mainly because it is such high movement, I don't want to place a Fey Line and then risk not having it, so if I need to trigger my Ancient Teachings but I know that we're going to be moving, then I will actually use Essence Font instead of Fey Line. Once again, I am just keeping my Hots up for this next Nova, placing my Fey Line and then using Chi G and cleaving off of the Star. At this point, we're just committing to the boss. Magma Tusk is one of my least favorite bosses this tier, mainly just because it has a lot of forced downtime and RNG can be pretty bad with the lava spray overlap with the debuff. This is a fight that we did do the cheese on in this run. We did it on a 22 earlier in the week, but I'm dumb and forgot to <laughs> record, so it is possible to do on at least a 22 without the cheese, but the cheese makes it significantly easier. I'm sure you've seen it on Wowhead. You throw the vial meant for the achievement on him during that first lava spray. It gives him two stacks, but it keeps him stuck at two stacks instead of going up to five. So that really reduces the healing requirement on this fight. You do still have to pay attention and cycle your cooldowns and cycle defenses, but it is much easier than the alternative. Because we're cheesing it to the point where it's like a 23 or 24 is borderline impossible without perfect play, I would expect to see this boss get tuned and I know that as soon as I put this video out we're gonna get the tuning pass from the previous Tyrannical week but that's okay because eventually it will scale back to the point where you are gonna want to make sure that you're cycling defensives and everything properly. 
This boss is mostly defensive use, it is mostly group wide healing, so you can cycle between Chi Ji and Shaylin's just like always, and then revival if you need to in a pinch. I typically like to hold defensives for the lava spray and the volatile mutation overlap because if you get hit by the lava spray later in the fight when it hits harder when he's supposed to have more stacks in addition to that dot that hits harder and lasts longer then you have the potential for a one shot and that's the big problem with this boss i'm popping chiji a little bit early here just because i want to make sure that we have some enveloping mist and enveloping breath coverage on the group for that dot Most of these bosses that have been on this video, on this list so far, are bosses that require group coordination between baiting charges, between using defensives to avoid one-shots, as well as other mechanics that may require your DPS to do something other than DPS. I think that's what makes them challenging, because not one person can kind of carry the fight, but I would expect to see some of the numbers tuned down, even though the mechanics will remain the same. The main difference with this fight between the cheese and not cheesing is you're just going to be using Vivify more. That's pretty much it. If you're not going to be cheesing it or if they fix the cheese, I would probably take Manatee in here for this boss as well as for the Forge Master. The footage from this run was a pug, so this isn't typically the way that we do it, but it does work. Usually I will be using Cocoon on the first Dragon Strike target unless they have Block or Dwarf or some other way to get rid of the bleed. You can use it later on in the debuff, about halfway through it, so that Cocoon also covers the Grounding Spear that they will receive. This is one of the buggiest fights I think that I have ever done. We did actually run this on a 22, but we had a problem where the chains, all three of them were broken within the time requirement, but the boss continued to cast and killed everyone, but didn't do damage to the tank. It was very weird. So this boss I know has riddled with bugs, but if it's working properly, you're not really going to spend a whole lot of time in melee during the damage phases. You can use Chi Ji and pre-spread your enveloping mist and your enveloping breath, and then just use Shaylin to top people between the third chain and the second chain. He does have that fiery focus underneath his feet though, so if you are going to try and be in melee, make sure that you are behind the boss if he is going to be moving. This is a boss that if you get targeted with Dragon Strike, you can meld, invis, anything like that. However, I would advise at this point to not do that, mainly because it has been causing issues with the spell queuing, and sometimes he will not spawn the chains that you need to kill the boss and stop the cast. So don't do anything weird with this boss and just try not to bug it out. I know that the Dragon Strike can also target pets, which bugs it out. So the big issue with this boss isn't necessarily that it's difficult to heal, but more that it's difficult to figure out what to do and what not to do when it comes to how the boss actually functions, whether or not it's an intended interaction or not, I don't know but it is just something to be aware of for this fight. Shaylin's and Chi Ji should cover every intermission. You also have access to all your defensives, health bot, and cocoon. This boss is a little finicky just because the stairs are line of sight and that has actually gotten my group killed a couple of times just because I was trying to heal someone but was not actually able to land a heal on them because of the stairs. For the first Might of the Forge, it is a big AoE into the Blazing Aegis, which is a three-person dot. 
I like to start out with Chi Ji and then just use my Renewing Mist and Enveloping to chop people up quite a bit and then Vivify Cleave to get everyone else chopped before the next might. This is a fight where you can cycle Chi Ji, Shaylun's Defensives, Revival, Cocoon, all of your things. The timers line up pretty well, although you might have some issues with the Blazing Aegis if you do not have things like Meld or Invis, things like that. Being able to stop the Blazing Aegis is actually super helpful. We did have someone die to a Swirly there, so they just waited until after that AoE to take the res. I went ahead and just revivaled, just to get everyone topped up because they were half health because of the res. Chi Chi doesn't line up perfectly with this, it will be a little late, but because of Chi Cocoon it's not a huge deal, so I like to use my Thunder Focus C with this one because it is a bit late. That one was targeted on me, so I went ahead and melted it. Looking back at this, I probably should have held because I did have cooldowns rolling and I do have a 10 stack of Shaylens, but I wanted to keep Shaylens for the next might. If you're having problems with the ranged players and their positioning for the stairs being line, you can ask them to stay to the sides because they will always be in line that way, as long as you're not across from them. Because Shaylens is kind of a longer cast and you may be having some AoE circles going out at the same time, you can precast it and just kind of clip people and then chop them before the AoE. And that brings us to the end of our video. If you guys have any comments or questions, feel free to hit me up on Twitch or Discord or in the comments below. I will also have the CD sheet, my UI and everything, talents, linked in the description. And I will see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.